All right, we are live. EJ had to go run and get a beer before we started, so I haven't even said hi to EJ yet. But hey, EJ. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm running, but I'm happy to be so, and you know, even happier to be here and ready to drink beer and talk football, because that's... Does it get better? I don't think so. I mean... Nah. I don't think so. Either. It certainly doesn't get better talking after a Chicago Bears victory. Uh no. No, you're correct about that. And and one that was possibly maybe a little bit unexpected by oh, I don't know, some members of the media. 95% of, of people that pick games. Yeah, something like that. What so we'll get into the the podcast here in a little bit, but I think it's worth just saying that we're on we're you know, we're live on YouTube. We're going to be coming to you likely every wednesday but you know stick with us there may be some times where we're going to need to move it around a little bit but this time feels pretty good feels like a good time to have a beer to me uh <laughs> wednesday at eight central it's six central for you so uh hopefully that that's okay completely um, reasonable for those of you that were you know, originally sub to in only new robert the bears over beers and you don't know us bears over beers is been around for this is the fourth season that we've been doing this and this is how we started off podcasting our first podcast uh, mutually here and the idea was that ej and i met up in his his home state and we shared a couple of beers and we talked about the bears and it was like wouldn't this be nice to bring this conversation to people because uh, we were talking to an audience of, well, let's let's call it three or four, our, right. both of our better halves, <laughs> and then your your dog, um, yep. you know, that seemed m much more entertained by us than the wives about this football talk. Yeah, it. Uh, both of our wives, both of our significant others um, are very happy that we found each other because then we can talk to each other about the bears and leave them out of it. Uh, I have to say it's the same with my other podcast partners uh partner uh she routinely tells me really glad that you take all that i don't have to so uh we're here to share all that with you and and really enjoy doing it right so uh format of this show has changed over the years the first couple of years this was very much a um a, a kind of an everything show, right? We tried to kind of, we, we did a recap and a preview in the same show. Um, and then it sort of evolved into last year where we were just doing a preview. And then this year we, you know, it's just kind of like me wanting to learn more from you and what you bring to uh, football and your, you, you know, your entry point into football, which is scouting. And it's something that I'm not you know very familiar with i don't know have all the fundamental tools of being a scout no one's going to hire me to be a scout I'll put it that way um and but i'm interested right i mm -hmm. i i'm always interested in getting better at football uh watching and you know understanding what i'm what i'm looking at and so i want to learn a little bit from you and so this year we're going to focus on uh one player each every week and we're going to talk about what they did well, what they maybe can improve on, what we saw from what, you know, what popped out, what we saw from technique, how they fit in the scheme. Is this a player that's going to be around for the long term? Do they have a lot of growth left? Are they kind of established and made it and all that? So um, that's kind of the concept that we're working with on for this for this show this year. Yeah, it's an exciting change for us to be able to focus. <laughs> um, like you said, we started all over the place and that was fun too. We've we've always had fun with this show. This this show started as a fun idea and both of us try and keep it that way because that just makes better content in our minds. If we're having a good time making it, you're probably having a better time consuming it. And this is a fun turn for this year because it lets us focus a little bit more. It lets us take one particular viewpoint and then sort of place that viewpoint within the overall context of bears football of of the defense or the offense wherever that player sits of the larger game of the season and like you said the future of the franchise is this player going to be a cornerstone or are they just somebody that's here for uh, a short duration and they'll be out did they did they have a lot of influence in the game did did their mistakes get covered up? All of those things are things that we can talk about through the lens or through the prism of talking about one player's performance in one game. Yeah, I think the one thing that kind of comes into focus a little bit is is the um, just how different the game is when you say, I'm watching this one player for the entire <laughs> game. 
and I'm not going to watch anything else because my assignment tonight is to talk about one player. So as much as I want to go look at somebody else along the line, no, right. I said I was going to watch Tevin Jenkins, right? So so it is kind of interesting, and um, you know, I, I did a little a little bit of this in the off season, and you'd watch like five six games of a player, and it was just it was just so weird because you'd come away like you you know you'd have a lot to talk about with one specific player. And, and it, it, it's a very interesting approach to football, one that I haven't taken much before. So I'm excited to learn more from you. I'm excited to get into some of this because, you know, we both know that this is this is a team that's rebuilding. They're trying to figure out who's going to be here for the long run. And we would like to figure that out as well. We would yeah. like to figure that out with them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It is a very different experience. And, uh, it's, I think, something that a lot of fans don't understand because it's not the way that the majority of people consume football. In fact, I would say it's the vast minority of people that watch it this way. Um, there are more of us all the time, and, and certainly some of the brightest and loudest voices in this space are people that do this. But if you're talking about overall numbers and, you know, say fans you're going to see in a bar, there might be one in the entire bar that does it this way. There might be two. Everybody else is there to consume the game. Uh, as a fan for the colors because they grew up there because they hate the other team whatever it is they're not they're not focusing in on a certain assignment or a player and it is very foreign and it does take discipline it is hard to do it's something you develop over time i i really appreciate it's almost like having fresh eyes on it listening to you go through that process because i that's the process i went through when i started you know 10 11 years ago it was like how do i do this i don't even know how to do this how do people do this and I'm always learning, like I'm continuing to learn. I, I learn stuff every year. So it's really cool that we get to sort of sort of peel back all the other stuff, uh, the commentary and the game day and the tradition and everything else and really just dial in on, hey, this is what we ask football players to do. And did they do it or didn't they? Yeah. And as you know, stick with us. We're, you know, the YouTube stuff for us is still somewhat new. So maybe at some point we're able to incorporate some all 22 video uh, to show you guys some of what we're thinking. There's a lot of, you know, there's at least a little bit of gray area and what you can show and what you can't. And, you know, we don't want to get in trouble. We don't want to go crosswise with anything. So we'll figure that stuff out. I pulled a couple of screenshots. So maybe at the end of the podcast, I'll pull up a couple of screenshots, just a couple of things that I thought were kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe we can, we can talk about that, but uh yeah, I don't know. I love that you, some of you guys are uh, with us that are, are telling us what beer you have. We'll we'll go over that on the podcast, what we brought on. I like that. You know, pr bring on a beer. Uh, tell us what you're drinking. Uh, you know, somebody's got a, a Bud Light. All right. You know, do what you got to do. Uh, Derek, <laughs> <laughs> Derek's, Derek's got a middle brow beer that he brought on. I like that. Right. Um, that sounds good. Uh, there's a shout out to the cheese draft. That oh, EJ boy. won. I get it. Um, I'm going <laughs> to carry that with me forever and ever. Yeah, you are mostly because that's, that's your gig. If you don't know JB, JB is very much about game theory. Uh, and he's also very much about winning. <laughs> and so he usually smokes me in whatever contest we come up with because he's, he's more invested than I am quite frankly. Um, and he's just better at it. He's got more practice. So, um, however, the cheese draft, uh, got one over on him finally. So, so, uh, where do you get your beer? You, I don't know. I don't know where you live. Go to a store, get you know? your beer at wherever you can get it. Right. Beer's what's in the, a lot of places, man. What's the best kind of beer? Uh, you know, cold. What's the second best kind free? Um, <laughs> you know, third is probably given, in glass. Yeah, given yeah. Beer, somebody yeah. that gave it to you. Yeah, for sure. Oh, all right. All right. So let's get into this podcast. Um, Gonna uh, reset here for a second and uh, we'll start recording. Welcome to Bears Over Beers. I'm Jeff Burkus, a writer for Windy City Gridiron, and I'm joined, as always, by EJ Snyder. EJ, welcome back to Bears Over Beers. Yeah, it's been a bit. We took a little bit of a hiatus. That felt good too. It's nice to nice to be able to take a break sometimes. One of my favorite things about Bears Over Beers is that we are not a daily podcast because <laughs> I have ultimate respect for daily podcasters because uh, even just this summer, I produced a piece of content every weekday for eight weeks. And that was a very short sprint 
Um, but it was really hard. And I have great appreciation for folks in the locked in network or, or other places where you have to produce some amount of content every day. And it is very nice for us to be able to step away, refresh, say, Hey, what do we want to do with this? And then come back recharged. I, I really like that. So I'm, I'm happy to be back. I'm happy we took a break. Both of those things are true. Yeah, it was kind of like summer vacation, right? From from school, like, you, hey, what'd you do with your summer break? You know, EJ went off and did a forty episode arc with with Brett Coleman, where he they did every team and every division, and they were insane, and they were recording like you know multiple episodes a night. And imagine all the prep that goes along with understanding what an entire team did in their off season and all that work. I did the Hopium Den, which was not every night, and it was a ten episode arc, and it was looking at the fan base, where the fan base is at, trying to get uh, a perspective from some of the, the fans that sort of pop up in the, in the Twitterverse and other places, interesting, unique voices that you may not have heard before on a podcast and figuring out, you know, where is this fan base? Are they hopeful? You know, do they believe in this new regime? And, and overwhelmingly, yes. And then, uh, you know, there was a question about Arlington Heights and the new stadium. Overwhelmingly, people were supportive of it. My mom, not so supportive of it. That was maybe the the one or two people that didn't like my mom was leading that charge, did not like the <laughs> idea of a new stadium. But, you know, what are you going to do? You can't please everybody. No. Nope. Right? So uh, that was a fun project. Enjoyed doing that. But now we're back into the season. We're back into doing what we really enjoy doing best, which is having a beer and talking about the Chicago Bears. And so we will start there with the beer. What is your first beer of the new season? Uh, it's a little bit of new and a little bit of old, which I, I, I felt that was appropriate. So um, went out to dinner last night and went to a place called Elliott Bay Brewing, which is uh, right up in Burien, just south of SeaTac Airport, for those of you that have flown into the Northwest. And they not only brew their own beer, they serve it on tap there, but they also can it and sell it. And uh, I had this earlier, I had this beer from them earlier this summer and I asked if they had it on tap and they said, no, we actually ran out and we we're going to try and brew a little bit more, but it's really more of a summer beer. And I saw that they had one six pack left in the cooler. So I snagged it and this is their Baja Lager. Um, and it is a, you know, light Mexican cerveza it has a little bit of a sweet tang to it, but just a touch. Most, um, Mexican lagers have just that little bit of bitterness go really well with a lime um this one's got a decent finish almost more like a pale so i quickly grabbed the last six they had because i didn't feel like them uh to wait for them to brew more uh and grabbed it home but that's uh probably the last i'll see of it for this season so i figured i'd snag it because it does feel like we're transitioning like summers i don't know about where you are i think probably it's starting to get a little bit crisper in the morning it certainly is around here it feels like we've transitioned from summer to fall football weather feels like it's coming so this field felt like an appropriate transition beer what do you have well i believe they call it false fall here in the midwest because we did have a few days where it felt crisp in the morning and it felt really nice i love the fall just from a weather standpoint as much as i love football um it, it's back to being hot like we're we're gonna we're gonna be upper 80s, lower 90s uh, here for the next foreseeable future. So, yeah. eh, what are you gonna do? We will get back yeah. into real fall soon enough. But it, you know the preview is nice. I'm bringing on something called scorched almond porter. Okay. And what scorched almond porter is is a beer from our mutual friend uh, Fitzy. Oh, nice! Sent us a care package, and I have been holding on to this so that I can. Uh, bring it on to the first episode of this this new year. It's from Wool Shed Brewery, um, and it says uh, their their tag is "Brew with a View." So this would be in Australia, mm. um, and 1.5 standard drinks is what it says, five percent alcohol. And what I was really liking is I can see you can see oh, here nice. that almond looks a heck of a lot like a football. It does. And so I was like, and it has like a black top. I don't know uh, how this many beers I've ever seen with that. This is great. Now, Fitzy, shout out to Fitzy. Andrew Fitzpatrick goes by Fitzy, uh, is a supporter and has been for a long time of both Bears Over Beers and the Bootleg Football Podcast, but currently lives uh, in New York City, but is from Australia, was born and raised in Australia. So when he goes home, he gets care packages and he sends us really cool stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, I've... I'll be right back. I'm going like 
three feet this way. Yeah, I, I actually got a jacket, and because it was cool the other day, Fitzy had sent me a jacket, and I put it on because it fits, and not a lot of things fit. So I can I'll, if fit right now. I can get into that at some other point. So I wore that out. First time wearing it. Yeah, I got a compliment. Someone <laughs> said, "Someone said that jacket is dope," and I was like, "Oh man, this jacket might be too cool for me." I I don't know. I think you can probably swing it, but uh, Fitzy sent me a koozie uh because they were talking about australian rules football and this is the western bulldogs uh commemorating their victory over the sydney swans in the premier cup from 2016 which is their championship game um so really fun stuff that fitzy sends along can't thank him enough so i'm gonna switch koozies midstream here i don't know if that's bad form but uh, that's what the jacket is it's the western bulldogs jacket nice. so very cool stuff um first sip of the beer really good my kind of thing. I do like that kind of stuff. I like darker beers. I haven't had a lot of beer this summer, so interesting getting back into that, but um, good flavor, good off the top. I think it's wow. going to be a good drinkable beer. So this is the fourth season that we've covered this team together. It's somewhere between 91 and 93 episodes that we've done. We've done a couple shorter episodes that I'm not sure that they count because we didn't crack a beer. So, wow. you know, it's, it's somewhere around there. We're in the 90s, right? We're in defensive lineman jersey number territory. Eventually yeah. this year, we're going to crack over 100. So thank you for all of you that have been with us uh, since the start. And thanks for the new people that are joining us. So um, what we're going to do this year is EJ and I are each going to watch one player. I think some weeks may warrant us watching the same player. I think if for we're sure. going to have like a Justin Fields uh, week, we might both want to watch him to see because there's going to be a lot to see. I also think that maybe at some point down the line, there may be other people that we can bring in to give, give another voice, particularly on a special uh, certain type of uh, position group might be might be useful to have some of that. So we will work with that. We'll work with this new format. We're really excited about it because it really flexes something that EJ has done for a long time and a lot of the value that he brings to the football universe. And it's something that I think that I can learn a lot from. So as much as anything, Bears Over Beers was created for us to you know, chat over a beer and talk about our favorite football team. And it's also for us to learn from each other. And this is a very clear uh, case of me trying to pull information out of EJ. Um, and EJ, eventually I'm gonna teach him how to bet. You know, I'm gonna teach him how to do the math on betting. So um, you know, th there will be give and take here, but That's right. this year uh, for this show, we are focusing on um, basically coming at it from a scout's perspective, reviewing a specific player each week, and I'm really excited about what we're doing with this year. Yeah, this is going to be really fun. So we we get to choose our players randomly. They're not chosen for us. Uh, at some point, we might open that up to the crowd if we feel that's warranted. Uh, in the beginning, we wanted to be able to, to have control over those picks. So we'll see. But uh, we figured we'd bring a little football into it. So we each picked a player. Uh, we'll introduce those players. And then we're going to have a coin flip. We're going to figure out who gets to go first. And if you win the coin flip, you can either go first or defer in classic football fashion, or make the other person go first. Um, but who is your choice of player for the week, JB? So the guy that I want to talk about this week is Tevin Jenkins. A lot made of Tevin Jenkins off season, very <laughs> up and down. I think to say the least of what was happening with him. Is he going to play? Is he not going to play? Is he going to play tackle? Is he going to play guard? What's up? Is he going to get traded? You know, what's happening with Tevin Jenkins? And so here I wanted to grade his first start at guard. And so I took a look at him, even though he he split snaps with Lucas Patrick, I still thought it was worth taking a look at him. What about you? I originally thought right after the game, we sort of texted each other and said, hey, do you have somebody in mind? Uh, my original thought was Jaquan Brisker. He had some pretty flashy plays in this game. I was certainly a fan of his pre-draft. Uh, his selection was a little bit controversial given that he was a safety taken high and a lot of people wanted offense to be prioritized. And I thought about that for a second. I looked at it a little bit more. We decided to decide the next day, sleep on it. And after I slept on it, I decided that I wanted to go after a guy that we ended up having... Um, the only guy that we got together right after his selection on a live stream and talked about, which was Dominique Robinson from Miami of Ohio defensive end. Uh, and he had a hell of a game. So I'm glad I switched now that I've watched the all 22 and gone back. They'll, they'll be time for Brisker. Brisker's going to make a lot of plays this season already did. Um, but Dominique Robinson uh, had a game that maybe some people didn't notice in a lot of ways. 
Uh, certainly they noticed the sacks, but there were a lot of other things. So I'm going to talk about Dominique Robinson this week. All right. And then you have instituted a coin flip rule. So do you have a special coin to flip? Uh, I don't think I do. I do have a coin sitting bad. next to me. It is All right. sitting in a holder. Well, I could do a, like a field turf flip. It is or a, a silver dollar. Like oh, that's beautiful. Silver, silver dollar that I got. So. All right. Well, gently flip your, your so wrap. I will flip coin. it, but I'm not going to take it out of its. its no, you don't need holder. to. You don't Just need to. I will so. bring a coin for next week. I was from 2005. I don't know why I have a silver I was dollar say, for 2005. Okay. I think it was a free giveaway. That's what I do. Hey, it's a free. All right. All right. So heads, tails. Heads is Lady Liberty. Tails is the Eagle. So okay. Hey, up in the air, go. Tails. It is heads. All right. Your choice. I will defer Ooh. to the second half. Okay. All right. Well, I will lead off then. Um, Dominique Robinson. Uh, so we'll start with some really basic breakdown. So he's drafted in the fifth round. Keep that in mind. That's, that's really late for an edge rusher. Um, you know, you might say, well, he's not an edge. He's a defensive end. Depends on the scheme. He is a guy that's going to get after the passer from the outside, different schemes that can be called edge outside linebacker defensive end. It, it really depends in Eberflus's scheme. It would be defensive end or strong side backer, but they don't rotate him down. So we're just call him edge for now. He's a pass rusher. He was 174th overall, so just about halfway, a little after through the draft in terms of overall number of choices. Uh, his relative athletic score, you'll hear us talk about that. Um, it's a combination of uh, both physical measurement and athletic testing, explosion, speed, things like that, put together by our buddy Kent Lee Platt, who has been on the program before, goes by Math Bomb on Twitter. Uh RAS for Dominique Robinson, 9.39 out of 10. Incredibly athletic. And if you're going to bet on athletes, edge is a very good place to do it. There are very few successful edge players who are not great athletes. Not a problem for Dominique Robinson. Uh, he is 6'4", 253 pounds. He has 33-inch arms. Big advantage when going up against those long-limbed offensive linemen, trying to get past them. Uh, and the explosion measurement I wanted to talk about is he has a 41-inch vertical jump. Again, 253 pounds can jump straight up in the air 41 inches. A lot of power in those legs, a lot of pop, and you saw that on tape. Now, sometimes te testing does not translate to tape. You saw a lot of that explosion out of his legs and tape, so we'll come back to that. I want to talk about his production. Now, people might say, oh, we're not stat scouting here. We're not, but we're going to talk about what it added up to. Uh, and then we'll break down how he got there. So his production versus the 49ers in week one. Seven tackles, 11 pass rushes. Out of that, he got two pressures, 1.5 sacks. Could have had two. We'll talk about that on the second one and how sacks are credited. A tackle for loss. And three hustle stops. Now, hustle stops are new this year. So the definition of hustle stops, this is an NFL next-gen stat, are defined as tackles resulting in a successful defensive play where the player covers 20-plus yards of in-play distance from snap to tackle. So this is one where somebody's having to cook all the way across the field and make the tackle on the other sideline. Or they started off in a pass rush and there was a completion to a tight end in the middle of the field. They turned around and ran 10, 15 yards downfield and made the tackle. So he had three hustle stops that led all defenders for week one, all defenders, not all rookie defenders. Um, that's a lot of running. And he is a guy that runs. He runs to the ball, which makes him a perfect fit for Eber Flus's system. Um, but, he got all this production as a second stringer. He is not the starting player in the rotation in his position. He is the second. He comes in behind Al-Qadi Muhammad. Uh, so he didn't even start and was getting second team reps, basically. Had a very light number of rushes compared to the starters, Robert Quinn. Um, and he still came up with all that production. That's incredibly efficient for the number he was snaps in the number of plays and impact plays he made really, really high. So it's a tremendous debut for the rookie. Uh, 
this comes into even clearer focus as we get into tape. But before I, let's see, a couple other things. He was the highest graded PFF rookie pass rusher. That's pro football focus. For those of you not familiar, uh, his PFF grade was 77.4. The second was another herald, heralded pass rusher in this draft, George Karlaftis, the rookie for Kansas City, who came in uh, about five points behind him. And then it was about a 20 point drop to the next rookie. So he was, he was an incredibly well-graded rookie. Um, and you have to consider the competition. Competition is really big. Sometimes you're going against a backup. Sometimes you're going against another rookie. Um, he was doing neither. He was going against Trent Williams and Mike McGlinchey, who are the tackles for the San Francisco 49ers. Trent Williams was probably the best player in the NFL last year, not the best lineman. He was probably the best player in the NFL. He was completely dominant on a week to week basis. Um, didn't get a lot of credit for it because he's an offensive lineman, but he had a really, really good season last year. He is an incredibly good football player. Definitely going to be considered for the hall of fame. This is not a slouch at tackle. This is the exact opposite. And Mike McGlinchey is no slouch. He is a very solid NFL tackle. He is not on the level of Trent Williams, but he is not somebody that you're going to get a lot over on. Typically, he is very proficient at his job and has been for many years. So this is not a place where you can, oh, the guy on the right's really good, so I'll go to the left, and that guy's a pushover. Both of these tackles are very good. In Williams' case, he's excellent. So the fact that a rookie in his first NFL game had this kind of production against that kind of competition matters. Um, yeah, I think what I'd jumped out to me, and you know, Lester and I talked about this on uh, Baron Balance on Monday, was just how much of an impact he was able to make with the limited snaps. And, and I think that just at first blush, when I thought, oh, he probably got like half the snaps, it's probably an even rotation. No, not even close to that. And, and so no. he, he was in the minority there, but he was the defensive end that was popping off. You know, let's see if he can replicate that. But it was a very impressive debut for this young man. And one of the things, and, and I want you to get into this, but one of the things that Lester and I saw at camp and then in the preseason was that he had such impressive get off and such impressive speed around the edge, but we didn't see the counter move until Sunday. We yeah. saw a counter move Sunday and we were really excited that we saw it. It was a beautiful move that we think he learned from Robert Quinn. And so I, I know you'll get into it, but yep. um, it was one of those things where you've seen growth in this young man in just the amount of time that he has been with the bears, with training camp, and this is only week one. So this, it's very exciting to see this growth to where he is today. Yeah. He, again, I think people watching the tape, definitely. Hey, that guy got a sack. He's a rookie. Cool. Like that's again, the way most fans watch football. That's probably what they came away with from Dominic Robinson's performance. If they are really interested in the draft or they're Miami of Ohio alums or something, and they were really focusing on him when he was on the field, which it was hard to do. It was a rainy game and with rotations, camera wasn't great. There was water on the lens a bunch. It was difficult to see sometimes when he was in and it's first game of the season. You're not used to all the numbers. A lot of numbers have changed. A lot of new faces on the team. Um, it can be hard to track one player. It's much easier to go back in a 22 or all 22 tape and, and focus in the full amount of impact he had was not felt by the average viewer. So um, it's, it is impressive to see the growth. He does have physical measurables, but you want to see those translated. And again, you saw some of them in camp, but we saw more of them. And one of the things that was most impressive about the entire game and it, and it figures into almost every play. So I'm just going to say it at the top is his recovery after something doesn't go right is liquid quick. There are plays where he got beat on the initial piece of contact. There's a run block where Trent Williams will talk about him, gets him like he tries to go up high on Trent Williams and Trent Williams just like shoves him out of the way like a school kid instead of just going oh i got beat by trent williams like he is back up on his feet moving gets around and actually comes in on the back side of the tackle and you see it over and over again that he'll something won't go right or or he'll get stymied on the first one or he'll go outside and the play goes inside he doesn't just stop his ability to pivot change direction and haul ass to whatever's going on is really consistent and it got him into a lot of these plays um, and made a big difference so that was a just a recurring theme that i kept marking down as i went through the tape i was like man his recovery is 
unreal. It's it's really, really good. So what I'm going to do is just give you the quarter mark and the uh, game time mark because not everybody has access to all 22 film. Um, so and just a note about what happened or what the play was. Um, some of them you'll know. Some of them you probably won't. Uh, some of them you almost definitely won't. So in the first quarter, we'll start there. Uh, 7.09 game clock. Great job spilling the edge on a play action run. Turns out that it's play action, so they were faking the run. But his job is still to get outside wide and make sure that if that ball gets handed off, nobody's getting outside of him and they're going to funnel that play into all the other Eberflus defenders who are flowing to the ball. Um, if it had been a handoff, not a play action fake, the, the back would have had to make a bad cut because of where he was. He was right where he needed to be at his blocker in front of him. He was far enough upfield that the back was definitely going to have to go inside and probably sooner than he wanted to. So it was just a great play. Again, not something that's going to show up on a stat sheet, but fundamentally sound, works with the defense, pass was to the other side. Everything's fine there. Um, quarter one, 617 in game time, Mark. Um, this is his first rush from left defensive end. They started him out. He rushed once or twice from right. They moved him to left. He's in a wide nine alignment versus Mike McGlinchey. Wide nine um, defensive alignment on the on the line goes from zero, which is straight up head up over the center, one to either side. And there are shades, uh, but we'll just go with numbers. One, two tech, three tech, which is outside shoulder of the guard. Four, four I, which is in between guard and tackle. Five is a really typical defensive end, basically lined up mm, head on just slightly outside the tackle. And then it continues. The numbers continue to get bigger. So wide nine, um, for those of you that have watched a lot of Bears football, um, the Lions used to run wide nine all the time in their defense. They would pop their defensive ends way out to the outside. Pagano had Mac run a lot of wide nine. Yeah. Wide nine is a is a way to generate space for a guy with great movement skills so he can get some speed. It's kind of a free release for a rusher. You're not going to have a guy right on your face that you're going to have to deal with as soon as the snap goes off. So they line up Robinson at a wide nine versus McGlinch. McGlinch is a right tackle. So again, Robinson's going to be on the left side of the defense. This is the first sack. Double hand slap to get cross face on McGlinchey. What does that mean? That means McGlinchey goes to get his hands up and get his hands into Robinson's chest. Robinson starts on his outside shoulder. And as he does that, as he sets that outside foot to get McGlinchey leaning towards the outside of the play, McGlinchey shoots his hands. Robinson takes both hands and slaps his arm down at the same time, shifting weight from his left foot to his right foot to get cross face on the tackle center line of a tackle is face right to get from one side to the other. We call that cross face gets cross face to the inside. Now McGlinchey is leaning to the outside, had his hands up and his hands are now on the outside and Robinson's going the other way on the inside hops to the inside, has the strength to pull down Trey Lance with one hand, grabs the back of his Jersey with one hand locks on and swings him to the ground pretty hard, forcefully slaps him down with just the grip strength. All of that is unreal, <laughs> like right. setting up McGlinchey like that, being able to clear his hands and move across his face in one move, basically one hop, get to the inside, burst, catch the quarterback from behind, not get a horse collar tackle, just grab a handful of jersey and then slap him to the ground as you're swinging out into an arc. All of that was a whole play. Like that's the one you're going to remember out of this game was, ooh, and that was his first rush from left defensive end in his first professional game. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people opened their eyes, said keeper. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's, that's impressive. Um, that's not a bad tackle. And you just whooped him straight up. Uh, we would call it a high quality sack. Um, meaning he didn't have the benefit of a stunt or help from another player. This is a straight up one-on-one -on -one, you and me. I whipped your ass sack. Um, that is the best kind. It is the hardest to generate. It takes the most skill. Um, there's lots of other ways to scheme up sacks. This is not a scheme sack. This is you rush versus the tackle and you go beat him. Um, great, now, great stuff. Now, I, I agree with the high quality sack piece of that. And I assume that Brandon Thorne is someone who's, you know, somebody who talks uh, and, and categorizes those as well. He's got a great, great way of talking about true sacks and all this kind of stuff. And it's always fun to watch Mac. Mac was always really good at getting those high quality sacks. Uh, one of the things I learned from Brandon Thorne was this, this move that 
I think that, you know, Robert <laughs> Quinn is famous for, um, you know, you, you called it saying double hand slap to get cross face, but they, he calls it something like a, a Euro chop, a right? uh, Euro step like, chop, Euro step chop. So yeah, that, that's what that refers to is that it's almost like a jump cut from a running back where it is. Yeah. It's a combination of a jump cut with the hand motion. So you're generating lean in the tackle by again, stabbing that outside foot tackle leans has to shoot his hands at that point because you're close enough to him that if he doesn't, you're just going to push him over. So the hands are coming and it's the combination of that jab, like a jab step in basketball. If you're familiar with a J cut or jab step, get a player's movement movement going away from where you want him to be. And then the hop and, you know, double hand slap or chop, basically bringing your arms down to clear his arms at the same time. And it's, it's a really, it's a very dynamic move. It requires three things at the same time. And he did them all like that. And, and one cleanly, it was, it was really impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. Uh, second quarter, seven twenty one at game time, just really good hustle to a reverse after rushing. Then he gets back downfield to tackle Lance from behind. So he starts on a pass rush. Trey Lance steps up, actually takes off on a quarterback run. Dominique, reverses field chases him down and gets in on the tackle this is one of those hustle stops where he ends up covering a lot of ground because he started not the wrong way he started the way he was supposed to go on the play play goes the other way he turns around a lot of defensive ends defensive tackles once that quarterback clears the line of scrimmage if the guy's as fast as trey lance there's they're gonna shuffle <laughs> towards the play but they're not gonna hustle towards the play they're gonna conserve some energy Robinson full sprint ends up being part of that tackle down the field. Um, third quarter, 1305. So right after halftime, massive hustle from the backside. This one gets all the way across the field, 20 plus yards for the tackles. He starts at the right defensive end position. He rushes, goes wide. The play goes away from him to the right side of the offense, the left side of the defense. He loops, keeps his pursuit angle tight, ends up all the way across the field, about 10 yards down the field, makes the tackle. You know, coming from the opposite side as a defensive end, chasing down, quote-unquote, skill position players, rare. Like, that's rare speed, rare athleticism, rare hustle. Um, definitely a notable play in terms of, you know, how did the play work out for the Bears? And this is the sort of difference of separating process from results. Right. The results were it was like a seven or eight yard gain for San Francisco. So you might look at it as a Bears fan and say, oh, we didn't stop him. If you're looking at process, holy cow, the guy that made the tackle was the right defensive end on the left hash way over there. So a little bit of a difference there. Uh, one of his rare negative plays in the third quarter, 1103 at game time. And this isn't a big deal. This is a little thing, but uh, it could be a big deal later. So uh, this is one where two plays string together and two players are getting to know each other on the field and getting to know strengths and weaknesses. Great blocking tight end Tyler Croft, uh, who had a tremendous block in the first quarter to spring the big run up the middle. Um, that was all him. If he hadn't been there, Travis Gibson would have destroyed that play. Um, so the play before Robinson gets the best of Croft. He ducks down a little bit, gets up under his pads, pushes him out of the way, and uses that great recovery to sort of go and be in on the play. Next play, he lines up against Croft again. He ducks his head. Croft saw it the play before and basically just takes the back of his shoulder pads and kind of roughs him to the outside. Um, something the rookie will do. This is like being a pitcher, right? You can't can't use the same pitch twice, at least not twice in a row in the same location. And he basically, he looked a little tired. He looked like he was just kind of putting his head down and pushing. And as soon as Croft saw his head dip, he basically out leveraged him. It wasn't bad. He didn't end up on his face, but it's one of those things that he wouldn't have been effective on that play, even if the play had been to his side because his head was facing the turf and his basically his hands were above his shoulders. So one of those little things, one of those little games where, okay, you got me last time, do it again. Nope, you're a rookie. I'm going to get you this time. Uh, third quarter, 927 of game time. He's slow off the ball, uh, and this is the second sack or the second half sack, sack 1.5 if you want to call it that. Off the ball, he was slow. Conditions were starting to get sloppy, but the huge monsoon hadn't started yet. Um, they were sloppy throughout the game, but they were starting to get pretty waterlogged. He 
almost looks like he slow plays it. He sort of stands up off the snap, doesn't get a lot of drive, doesn't sort of immediately engage the tackle, but he does set Williams up deep. Once he starts making momentum, he is going towards Trent Williams' outside shoulder. Williams, come, he comes across Williams' face. He doesn't use the same move, and he does get grabbed. Now, Williams gets his hands out, gets his hands on him, and slows him down. Typically, at that point, the play would be over. Uh, but Robinson doesn't quit, which is really important. And coverage does its job. Robinson's first contact with Trey Lance, this is the sack that he shares with Roquan. First contact is from Robinson, and it's at 4.3 seconds into the play. That's pretty long. If you're timing a play, most of your options should have worked out. So Robinson doesn't quit. He keeps at it. And Williams gives up on this play. And I never thought I would say this. Trent Williams gives up on this play. They are near the goal line. They are well in the red zone. They might even be in the short red zone right here. They're right somewhere around the 10 yard line looking to score on the bears. Trent Williams is a veteran knows that in that condensed field, ball's got to come out, right? Snaps got to come up and something's got to happen within the first two and a half to three seconds. So he stands up, he gets Robinson as he goes by, grabs him. And then he literally, you see Williams just unbow his back, stand up and kind of let go. Robinson tears off, gets Lance at 4.3 seconds. Rokon comes in, hits him. That's the 1.5. That's the sack there. So kind of a good combination of good play from Robinson. He did what he was supposed to, and Williams let him have one, really. Um, if he'd stayed on him with that grip, he wouldn't have gotten anywhere near Lance. But he was like, look, we're four seconds into this thing. We're at the seven-yard line. Either it happened or it didn't, and it didn't. And he ends up getting a sack off that. So a little bit of plus, a little bit of minus. You know, I we talked about that with EJ a little bit. I thought that he had uh, – Williams had Robinson on the outside. Well, he didn't have his chest plate. He didn't have mm -hmm. his chest. He had, he had his shoulder. And so when Robinson changes directions, with, to Lance is stepping up in the pocket and Robinson changes directions, Williams, as a smart pro, is going to know that if he shows that shoulder coming <laughs> off, he's going to get called. Yep. And so – I, I guess I didn't catch him giving up. I, I caught him saying, I don't want to get called for holding and I'm going to, I'm going to release this hand um, because he was this close to being, to showing that he was going to, he was going to get that. And then when Rob Robinson finishes that play, he got up and he did not celebrate. I think he was upset because I think he thought that he wasn't going to get credit for the sack or something. Like, there's something like mm. that. He didn't see that. Like I'm, I'm excited I just sacked this guy fr from him. He just kind of got up like, oh man, I'm frustrated. Um, so it was kind of an interesting play there, but I, I, I interpreted it more as I'm, I'm, I'm letting go because uh, I don't, I don't want to get the hold because I'm feeling him pull away here. And he knew that he didn't have the chest. He had the shoulder. I think it's both um, from the back. So uh, for those of you that don't know, all 22 is two versions um, of the same play for every play. The side version is from a camera much higher up and encompasses all 22 players on the field, 11 offense, 11 defense. So hence the name all 22. Then they switch to an end on or end zone angle and it's tighter. It comes in so you can really see the line play and the tackles. You cannot see the wide receivers and the corners. Um, you can see the safeties if they're in a the middle alignment, but it, it just alternates like that. So it's two views of one play over and over again. From this particular angle where the camera is on all 22, the 49ers backs are to the camera and Robinson is rushing towards towards your face. So uh, from the TV angle, you can see more of that hand on the outside. And I think that's a totally legitimate and viable sort of veteran savvy move to go, man, if he pulls this way and I've got my hand outside his frame, I'm getting the flag. The other one is you can see his leverage from the back. He literally straightens up like he couldn't have done anything anyways. He stands up straight, which, you know, as an offensive lineman, you're you're done. You've given up all your tools. Yep. I didn't see that in real time. I just wanted to. Yep. That, that's how I interpreted it when, when Lester and I talked on Monday. So, well, uh, I think it's both. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think it's a combination. Plus, he look, it's four and a half seconds in your seven yard line. Something bad's going to happen if right. something good <laughs> hasn't happened already. Right. So. Interesting play. We talked about how sacks, uh, I talked about how sacks are credited at the top. The, I saw some chatter today that he could have been given a full sack for this one because um, 
Lance was already going down when he would have made the play without Roquan. I, you know, I can see it, but Roquan hit him hard. (laughs) Like Roquan brought more force to that particular pairing, which is why I think he kind of earned the half. So I'm, I'm not super upset about it. It's a great play either way. Uh, It's a great play for the bears in general with team defense. Uh, It's a nice play for Robinson. Um, Third quarter, 342 of game time. This is where he hits Williams up high in the run game and gets tossed. Trent gets him with his arms uh, because Trent has really long, really strong arms. He's got a strong punch, but he uses that ridiculous recovery and gets back into the play. Um, So he totally gets shuffed to the outside. Play is coming in behind Williams, and he still gets up loops around and because of that hustle is back in the play. That's, That's the part that catches my eye. He'll learn not to hit Trent Williams up high. Uh, if he hasn't already, but um, it's that hustle that, hey, even when I do something wrong, I'm going to go try and do something right. Um, his pursuit angles in the run game are really good. You can see there's a couple of plays, again, where he's pursuing a long ways uh, all the way across the formation. And you can see him continually adjust that path to be the most efficient. I'm, I'm getting there as fast as I can, but if I stay here, I'm going to end up behind him. I'm going to you know, continually two or three times during my long run, just tick it in um, and make sure that I'm on the most efficient path to the ball carrier. That's impressive. Um, Also takes a lot of effort. A lot of edge rushers put a lot of effort into their pass rush, not as much effort into pursuing the run game. Robinson does an equal amount on both. Um, Late in the game, fourth quarter, and this this is as much on the coaching staff as it is on him, and it's a good thing. They packaged him with Quinn for the first time. They decided, hey, this is the guy that, you know, they're over there on the tablets. They're looking at the plays. They're saying, this is the guy that's getting movement. Late in the game, when the game counts, when it's on the line, it's a tight game, we want him rushing. We want him in the top, you know, if we're talking about hockey, we want to move him up to the top line. We need scores, right? Um, And interestingly enough, the first time that they packaged Quinn and Robinson together, you know what play it was? Yeah, interception. It was the Eddie pick. That's the first time they both rushed together. And did they influence the interception? Not really. Quinn was closer. He got a pressure or a hurry. Robinson was rushing off the other side. Um, But it was just fascinating to me. The first time they paired those two guys and that they'd switched up the line, it it represented a switch in rotation because before that they'd been really disciplined about um, Quinn and Aqua Muhammad. And when they came off, then it would be Gibson and Robinson as the sort of second line. This was the first break in that in that pattern. Um, fourth quarter, 412 left in the game. Third time they used Robinson and Quinn together. Robinson again hustles to make the tackle after a rush, and he's in on the forced fumble that didn't count. Runner was down by contact, but that was Robinson's hit, and it was after a pass rush. So just more hustle plays. Uh, fourth quarter, four minutes left, draws a double team. This is crazy. Part of it you can look at and you say, oh, it's a scheme. The guard came off. He was kind of looking for work and there was nobody else out there. Guard could have gone either way on that play. He could have helped the center who was engaged or he could have gone to Robinson's side. He went to Robinson's side to help McGlinchey. That's nuts. (laughs) You're talking about a rookie fifth rounder in his first game in the NFL and the guard chooses to go his way. Right. Okay. <laughs> like that's <laughs> the NFL is a meritocracy. It's about respect. It's about who gets results. And, and Robinson had been the problem on the line up until now, even more so than Quinn. And, uh, you know, yep. they're going to react to that. So good on the bears for reacting and repackaging and adjusting, making an adjustments for years. We've been saying on the show, please make halftime adjustments. Please make halftime adjustments. That's a halftime adjustment. Um, uh, 229 left in the game, lined him up in the three technique for the first time. Now, this is called a NASCAR package. This is three. Uh, Eberflus might call it something else. Typically, it's called a NASCAR package when you take an exterior rusher, either a defensive end or an edge, and you line them up in what is traditionally a DT role, three tech. Um, this was the first time they'd done that, and they moved him inside to the three tech role. So he was the third pass rusher. Um, uh, more hustle down the line stops Lance for a really short gain. I thought it was, I thought it was no gain. Turns out it was like a half yard. So he doesn't get, cause if you get a quarterback running for no gain, it's a sack. Um, doesn't count as a sack. It's about a half yard gain, but still really effective play. And then the next play, another tackle on the stunt for maybe a one yard gain. 
and on his final rush of the game, he gets he rates the double out of four linemen, four defensive linemen for the Bears. They all get singled. He gets double. Last play of the game. And again, Robert Quinn was on the field for that rush. Right. Like the guy that set the single season Bears sack record last year was on the field, and they doubled Robinson, not Quinn. Right. Whew, I need a cigarette. That was a hell of a game Um, from a rookie, a fifth rounder. When we talked about why he was available in the fifth round, it was a very deep draft. There were more players in this draft than right. in, in a very long time. You don't typically get guys with his athleticism, but right after he got drafted, we got on, we did the quick pot about it. And I said, man, I'm really excited. This is a guy that you typically wouldn't get in the fifth round. He'd be like a third round choice in any other draft. Bears just got lucky here and they were smart enough to pull the trigger. Oh boy, do they look smart right now? Cause that's a very good offensive line. I know it was sloppy. It wasn't super monsoony until like the very end of the fourth quarter. Both teams were playing in the elements. I think more has been made of the rain than maybe should be. He still had all that production in less than half the snaps. So somebody asked me earlier if I had the number of snaps, I didn't get the snap count. I need to get with Lester and figure out where he gets his snap counts. Cause he's always really good about that. Um, I don't have them. I'll have them next week when we do our breakdowns. But this is a ridiculous debut from from Dominique Robinson. Your questions about, um, you know, is he going to be a building block? If he keeps playing like this, absolutely. He's going to he's already passed Travis Gibson, um, who had a pretty average game, who we were really excited about last year in the sort of developing pass rusher role. Um, I've got 28 snaps for him. Um, okay. for, on what I saw, cool. but I will say that I used that for Tevin Jenkins and I had a different snap count by the time I ended. Now I may be wrong. That's okay. That's a but, good, but yeah, rough so it's about that. It's going to yeah. be 28, give or take. And I just wanted to give this sort of impact overall to the outcome of this game. We'll talk about whether or not he's a building block as we go on. One game is, is an overreaction. If he continues to play like this, he's absolutely going to be, but progression's not linear. Um, Overall impact for this game, impactful. He kept Trey Lance and thereby, you know, the 49ers offense off balance all day. If he doesn't do that, it, they might not win the game. It would certainly be closer. I know it was close anyways, but he he moved the needle. He himself moved the needle in this game. And to be able to say that about a fifth round rookie is is great and ridiculous at the same time. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think it was a really great debut performance. It's somebody that we're excited about before the draft. We're excited about right when they took him, when you and I both talked about him, uh, excited about him in camp, excited about his progression and what he's adding. Uh, you know, that the idea that, you know, we got to get rid of Robert Quinn, right? Like there's a lot of people are saying, hey, you got you to you trade Robert Quinn. You gotta, we got to get him off the team. Okay, I understand that from an analytics perspective. But here's another perspective is that Robert Quinn is a savvy pro and he's now the teammate of a guy like Tommy Robinson. And he says, Hey, Rook, what do you think about this move? You think you can pull off the, the Euro step cross chop? Yeah. And all of a sudden he's got a new tool in his tool bag, because I got to tell you, if Dominic Robinson only rushes off the edge, he's not Von Miller. Like, I mean, he's very good off the edge, but he's not bendy around the edge and going to be this one of one uh, bendy pass rusher like Von Miller. Right. He needs other tools. And so Robert Quinn teaching him that and, and mentoring these young players, that's worth something. There are guys like that that are on this team that are good professional football players that are teaching some of these young guys. You know, Riley Reef, maybe he doesn't play a lot, but he is going to be a good presence for those offensive linemen down the line because he's a good pro and he's proven it year in, year out. So, you know, it, so I, I get a little, you know, worked up about the idea like you got to just get, you know, you got to maximize value and you got to get rid of this. You're, you're kind of ignoring the value of the actual human element and the actual what happens in a locker room, what happens on the practice field for some of these young guys. You want these young guys to develop, you need people there that are going to help them do that. And I think we've seen proof positive in the first game what that looks like. Yeah, and to everybody saying, you know, people might bring, again, a different position mentality to this. Uh, 
much is made about quarterbacks, especially aging quarterbacks, mentoring young quarterbacks who are going to take their job or not. Right. And, and they get judged for that, whether they do that or whether they're open to that. There's a lot of interpretations to that. If you're going to flip that and look at a guy like Robert Quinn, it's to his benefit for Robinson to be as effective as possible, right? Because if Robinson is giving people fits and starts drawing double teams, those are double teams that Quinn is not going to see. Quinn is going to get more one-on-one matchups and at his age, he would love that, right? So the better he can make Robinson, the faster, the more it benefits him, right? Because mm-hmm. if he can get that guy to be a, a tension magnet for protection and take the chips and all those extra hits that he doesn't want. And it gives him more one-on-one rushes. That's better for Robert Quinn. So it's in, in his best interest to help the rook develop as quickly as possible and be a real threat. Yeah. You think Khalil Max upset that Joey Bosa's on the other side of him in LA? Like he didn't, he didn't that. look upset on Sunday. I mean, he looked upset, but not at Bosa. <laughs> he sucks. He he looked upset, but mostly with the offensive tackles that he was literally using as bowling pins. All right. Awesome review. We're going to take a quick break on the other side of the break. We're going to talk about Tevin Jenkins for much shorter because I'm not equipped to give that level of detail, but we will talk about Tevin on the other side of this. All right, EJ, we're back. So let's talk about Tevin Jenkins. Now, I'm not going to have that level of detail that you provided. Um, not yet. I will, I will work up to that. And we, we will we will work on that. So I'm going to talk. I think we know the story of Tevin Jenkins, obviously high profile pick, second round pick. You talk about the RAS uh, information from uh, Kentley Platty, who, you know, I, I'm, I've i met at the Senior Bowl. You've met. Um, great guy. Uh, really like supporting his work. And when Tevin came out, his... Uh, his RAS numbers were quite high as a tackle. Uh, the, everybody was sharing those around 9.74 as a tackle. So one of the most athletic tackles to come out in quite a while. But then if you put him up against a guard, he's 9.97. Yep. So taking that athletic profile that scores incredibly well as a tackle, you move him to guard, he's even, he's even more off the charts. So this is a guy that that brings in a, a high athletic ceiling. He had a back surgery last year, so you wonder how much that slowed him down in the offseason. We don't know exactly what was happening in terms of, was it just his, I don't want to say pride, but he you know he, he wanted to play tackle, and they said, no, you're, you're guard for us. And maybe he was trying to force a trade. Maybe he... Maybe he was upset. Maybe it was something else. Maybe it was a recurrence of the back. We don't know. We can speculate. That's not really our thing. We don't really like to speculate. We just know that he wasn't really on the practice field. He was in the meetings. He was attentive. But he he was uh, not participating fully in training camp until late. But he has ramped up. He's been in the starting lineup since he sort of committed to playing the guard position. And this was his first start. That was a split start because they wanted to get Lucas Patrick on the field. Lucas Patrick broke his thumb or had a, had a thumb issue with some thumb surgery. He can't snap. But the future of this line for 2022 is to have Lucas Patrick be the center, Mustafer is the top interior backup, or at least the top center backup. And then Tevin Jenkins plays right guard. So they did something very unique. I mean, a lot of, I don't know a lot of examples of a team platooning their guard I mean, that's very high school, right? Like, I mean, I, I don't really have a good professional yeah. analog here where you, you're like, oh yeah, you know, this guy plays two possessions. And then we get the other guy that comes in and plays two possessions. And, you know, it, I didn't see any sort of giveaways or anything like that. Like, oh, well, we got Tevin in so we can run these plays now. Uh, oh, we've got Patrick in. We're going to, it wasn't like that. They were just running the offense. Um, but I do think it was good overall to, to get Patrick into game shape um, and a little bit to maybe, uh, help bring Tevin along in his first start and not let him string together some bad plays. So um, I will go through what I saw and, and uh, you stop me where you want. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of talk about Tevin. So, um, and I'll give my grade at the end. So what I did was I, I did what I think Lester would do for grades. So I went through and I, I marked every single play yep. that I saw him and I graded, I graded them. Now, some, now somebody might go through and they might grade it a different way. With a, with a different standard, I did 
plus minus. And then I actually did mark splash plays because I think that if you make an above and beyond play, I want to mark it down. Lester doesn't really care about style points. Totally understand that. Um, but I did mark those down and we'll talk about those. Um, and I gave him bonus points at the end on my grade because, you know, as a former offensive lineman, I would certainly want a little call out for a splash play. So um, I thought he struggled early. Um, I, I'll get into my grade later, but the majority of his negative plays came within the first two possessions. Um, I, uh, I noticed a lot of his negative reps came in the run game. Um, his, his pass game was a little stronger, but I think in the run game, he, he struggled a little bit more. And that was that was interesting to me. Um, but I also saw that in the preseason where I didn't think that he was latching on as a run defender quite yet. Um, he, he didn't have his hands and feet moving together. Uh, and so that's something that I want to I want to keep keep an eye on. Um, he does seem like he's a little grabby, particularly grabbing on the outside, which I think is going to lead to some holding calls um, as as unless he cleans that up, you know, as a as a. Offensive lineman, particularly as a guard, uh, if a defender gives you his chest plate, you take it. And I don't care how much you're holding his chest plate, they're never going to call it because you're inside the numbers. Um, and unless this guy's twisting away and you've refused to let go and you literally yank his jersey off of his uh, off of his chest plate, they're never going to call a hold on you. Um, I don't think he's figured that out yet. I think he thinks that everything is fair game and he's going to grab shoulders. He's going to grab whatever he can. Um, and so he's, he's a little grabby, a little handsy, right? Um, and so that that's something that you're, we're going to need to watch. Um, I think that if he had more plays where he was the the blocker at the point of attack, we would have seen a penalty called because there he was close a few times where um, I would have thought about throwing 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 the flag. On the, in the run game, I saw a ton of double teams, and usually it was jinking uh, Tevin scraping to the second level. I think that. Double teams in general, it's a feel thing. Um, he worked with Mustafer a lot, and some of them looked pretty good. I'll highlight one of those in a little bit. Uh, some of them, they didn't stick on it long enough. That just takes time. I'm not, I don't think you freak out in week one. You're also going against some incredibly gifted defensive linemen. This is a very good defense. These are very talented defensive linemen, probably the most talented defensive line that they're going to play all year. And so you have to take that into consideration. But there are some elements there of that double team that takes time. We talked about, uh, Lester and I talked about in the offseason quite a bit, that we just want to get the five, five best on the field, five guys that can play, and then you let them gel. And the, the part about the gelling is in that pass game where you're passing off, where the defensive line is trying to play games with you. And so you know that you can let that guy go because the guy next to you, you, know, you feel confident is going to pick that guy up. Um, but in the running game, a lot of that comes down to double teams and knowing and f- by a feel when you can scrape to the second level. When Tevin did scrape to the second level, he has incredible athleticism. He didn't really do a great job of getting to the second level to and actually engaging in the in the block very frequently. But I also want to say a lot of times that was because it was Fred Warner. <laughs> Yeah. And Fred Warner, it doesn't get better than Fred Warner. I mean, I know we all love Roquan Smith, and now they're playing different positions. But one for one, Fred Warner is is a better football player. I think he's the best in the league at his position. And so maybe not necessarily j- judge Tevin Jenkins too harshly on that. When it was a different linebacker, he was able to 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 get an at least shield if not be able to to latch on and complete a block but he didn't do it very often with warner once or twice he got him um in uh in pass pro one of the things that i noticed that he struggled against uh, javon kinlaw's a power move and it was an interesting move to me kinlaw sort of engaged him in a bull rush and then uh basically i think he had a hold of tevin and then would would pull him and then swim over the top. So he was already a couple steps into his bull rush, and then he was yanking Tevin to one side and then swim over the top. Very powerful move. I mean, that is that is all kinds of power to get in as a bull rush and then reverse direction and swim over the top. It's just a pretty impressive 
man move for an interior defensive lineman to, to kind of do that to a big guy like Tevin Jenkins. He did that to him twice. The first time he beat him. I mean, it was clean beat and, you know, a, a negative play. Second time he did it, Tevin recovered enough to, to prevent him from making the play. A lot of an arm bar. And again, one of those that was like, mm, I, that ref was probably like, eh, all right. You know, like it was close. <laughs> it was close. Um, and so Jenkins is going to have to to understand when that happens. Uh, there was a there was a pass rush against uh, Eric Armstead, who again, another very impressive athlete, very good defensive lineman. Um, he had a lot of reps against Armstead in this game. Actually, by the end of the game, looked like Armstead was tiring, and he did pretty well against him. Um, there was one pass pro rep where uh, he sta- uh, Jenkins stopped his feet in pass pro, lost the step to the inside, and then was late in recovering. So when he's using his hands. He's got to remember to keep his feet going because he he sort of stopped his feet, punched, and then, oh, no, I, I have to get back here. Um, and so, again, these are very talented defensive linemen, but these are these are some growth points for, for Tevin and learning how to play guard here. Uh, splash plays, number one. Uh, one play where he wasn't – he didn't have anybody over him. He wasn't engaged at the start of the play. Uh, Bosa is working on uh, uh, Larry Borum. And Tevin can go either way. Mustafer was engaged uh, with Armstead and uh, Bosa's around the corner. He decides to go uh, take a look at, at Bosa and he catches Bosa trying to come back to the inside of, of Borum and just lays him out. And he gives him a little bit of a look like I just knocked you down. And, and then he kind of sees over his shoulder that Fields is he, he's scrambling. And so he has the presence of mind to take off and try to find, he refines Armstead down the field. And, you know, now he's a lead blocker on a field scramble and Fields is able to get some pretty positive yardage out of that. And in, in most part, because Jenkins is leading the way. That to me is a, a fantastic play from a guard. You're looking for work, you find it, you take out one of the best pass rushers in the league. And then you look, you have the recognition to re- understand that you're still live and you take off and you make a good run block downfield um, for a positive gain. That, to me, was his best play of the game. Just thought it was just fantastic and very heady, and I, I'm, I was very, very impressed with him. The, the second splash play that I want to talk about um, – oh, thanks, EJ. Um, the second splash play I want to talk about is with, um, with Larry Borum – they had a, a double team on, on Armstead and uh, Jenkins sticks with the Armstead block. Borum peels off for the most part uh, on the double teams, particularly with Mustafer. Jenkins job is to get the block completed and handed off to Mustafer. And then he peeled off to the second level. This time he had the block and he kept it. Um, and he just kept, kept uh, the, the, that double team was very effective. You have two very giant p- people pushing in another giant person, um, but he was able to, they were both able to actually move him off the point. That's the point of a double team. You want to move that man off the ball, right? A lot of times the double team will start that, you know, you're trying to do that and it doesn't actually happen. The, 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 the defensive tackle doesn't move. He's able to hold his ground. The guy peels off and then all of a sudden, the defensive tackle ragdolls the the guy that's left makes it makes a tackle for no gain right like that's that's kind of the worst case scenario of a double team is the defensive tackle beats it in some way this they moved armstead off the ball they moved him off the ball a few yards jenkins got it going um and finished the block and to me that was and that was at the point of attack and that was on a that was actually on a herbert run um and so that was uh that was a really nice nice play out of that so um, those were the two that I gave him kind of splash play credit for. So when I added it up again, there's a couple plays where I think I could have given him a negative, but I, but I gave him, you know, the, okay, like, okay, you know, kind of did his job, maybe a little sloppy. The technique wasn't quite there. So maybe I'm a nice grader. Somebody else might come in and say, this was, you know, this, this, you're crazy, Jeff. There, there's no way that, that he had that high of a score. Um, but I gave him four negative reps um, and 25 positive reps with two splash reps. Um, I only had 29 reps total, 
So two of those 25 were splash reps for me. I only had 29 total. The sheet that I saw said that he had 31 plays. I didn't grade the 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 penalty that that offside. Yep. That's only one. So I don't know if I missed another one or if you know that that, that play was counted somewhere else or I missed something in the all 22. I had 29 reps. That's what I'm going with. I didn't have time to go back and try to see if I lost a, a rep somewhere. If you do that math by Lester's math, that's an 86% for Tevin on those plays. I'm going to give him two bonus points for those two splash plays. I'm going to give him an 88. And I'm going to say that's a B plus. That's a great grade. Again, considering the level of talent that's involved here, it's it's just like Dominique Robinson going against great tackles. Like you said, this is one of the most, if not the most talented defensive line the Bears are going to see all year. There's there's talented defensive lines up and down the league, but the assemblage of talent on the San Francisco roster is uh, certainly at the first level. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about backups if we want to, but the first level is wildly impressive. You are dealing with, they've spent a lot of draft capital. Armstead, Ken Law, Bosa, all high picks. They, it is a point of emphasis for that team to have quality defensive starters on the front. And D'Amico Ryans is one of the best up and coming young coordinators in the league. Job he did last year with the San Francisco defense was, was inspired. And they have players like Fred Warner behind that, right? So if you do get to the second level, it's, it doesn't get a whole lot easier. Um, the idea that he can help can hold his own at a position that he has not spent a lot of time at. He has played a little bit of guard, but he by and large was a tackle at Oklahoma state. Like he had the majority of his starts at right tackle, almost all he had a little bit of time at left tackle subbing for an injury, uh, part of a season, but the vast majority of the time at Oklahoma state, he played right tackle. So, it is a different position. He did make that transition not long ago. The Bears didn't decide like a year ago, you're a guard and you're staying there. And he's been working at it consistently since then. To see him be able to come out against that level of talent in a first start at what accounts to, you know, basically is essentially a new position. And he didn't just get like laid the hell out is, is really, really solid. Um, there's room to grow. He's a great athlete. There's a lot of things, um, you know, even just watching the game back and condensed, uh, you saw him, you know, reaching, you saw places where, it, like you said, it could have been better. He could have scraped sooner. Um, you know, want to see him come off that want to see him stay a little bit closer. The gaps between him and Borum got a little bit big. Sometimes that's, that's all feel stuff. That's what you're talking about in terms of gelling, when people say gel for the offensive line, that's what they mean is like, hey, I could step up and get this guy, but then there'd be a you know two and a half yard gap here between me and Borm. I should probably kind of just angle back here and see if anybody shakes loose. And by later in the season, hopefully they're going to have that dialed. Um, as a debut, uh, you know, Tevin's Tevin's start with the Bears has been star cross to say the least. It's been up and down really hard. Um, you know, there was even serious motion that if he didn't take to the guard thing and whether that was saber, saber rattling or, or not like, Oh, maybe we're going to, you know, they did ask about a trade. People say they never asked about a trade. Yeah, they did. They did for certain a hundred percent. I can guarantee it. Yep. Now, whether they were serious about that or whether they were just trying to basically, I'm going to call him a rookie, even though he's a second year player, they're just trying to shake the rookie's cage a little bit and say, Hey, with us, it's guard or the highway tackle is not happening. Like, I know you've always wanted to be a tackle, but with us, you're going to be a guard. Like, regardless of all that sort of offseason politics, he got on the field week one against a very talented defense, and he laid some guys out, and he made some mistakes, but they weren't huge, and the Bears won the game. Let's talk about the bottom line at the end. That's not bad. He easily could have been the weakest link with everything we've seen leading up to this point, and I would say that he wasn't. Yeah, I'll be curious to see what happens with a full game of reps. And, you know, I think in a way, I think that's probably helped settle him down. Like I said, the first, most of his negative plays came early. And then he did seem like he settled in. And that was the way for the entire team. Offense, oh, defense. Sure. Um, and I, I, 
I got to give a shout out, Fitzy, you're a legend, and it plays well into your question. What do we think about adjustments? Thank you very much for the support. That's incredible. Um, yes, we too are bullish on the new coaching staff of culture, and a lot of that's because of what happened in this game and what we're talking about right here, which is early on in the game, ooh, the first quarter, both sides of the ball, not great like it not great it it looked rough and if it stayed that way they'd have lost the game and sometimes under the old regime it did stay that way whatever was going on in the first or second quarter they just sort of seemed kind of locked into it we didn't get a lot of great adjustments sometimes we did which made it even more frustrating because we're like we know they can do it they just don't always do it um they did it in this game a uh, bunch of folks in the chat have been referencing the adjustments they made on bosa from the offensive line standpoint going in the second half um I talked about some of the adjustments they made in the pass rush, uh, switching up the lines. Like they made adjustments throughout this game. They, they certainly made adjustments. Getsy made adjustments with Justin Fields, um, which again allowed them to counterpunch, right? To rotate from that back foot, which is clearly where they spent the first quarter, to the front foot and start having a puncher's chance. And that's what they took throughout this game and ended up with the W. So, yeah, very positive about the new coaching staff. Uh, I said this on a stream I was on on Saturday. Uh, for those of you that know Barrelissimo, um, he did a great charity stream on Saturday, invited me to come hang out with him for a little bit. Uh, it was amazing. But we were talking about this and what we wanted to see and and what we thought of for adjustments and all that. And, uh, you know, a lot of it was like, well, time's going to tell. When the bright lights come on, we'll see what they actually do. And if they keep this close, if they keep this particular game close into the third quarter, and it's not a shootout, they could win this game, right? And I talked about the expectations from this staff being very clear. And it is very clear to all of us who are watching from the outside that they're being very clear with the players, right? And it doesn't matter what your status is or what your pedigree is or what your contract is or anything else. They are saying, if you are going to play this role, this is what we expect. And then they are sitting down and there's a lot of accountability and they're saying you did or did not do these things. And if you didn't, you know why? Because we were very clear coming in that if you play this role, these are the expectations you did or didn't meet them. And then they can talk about how to meet them if they didn't. But there's not this like, Meh, you know, you're in the good graces. You're in the doghouse. It's this is the role. You did it or you didn't. Here's how to fix it. If you don't fix it, we're very clear. We'll be moving on to somebody that does. And I think that kind of accountability plays with players right? There's not favorites. There's not politicking. There's not, oh, well, we paid a lot of money or he was a high draft pick or anything else. It's this guy's supposed to fill the gap. He fills the gap. He plays. Yeah. I think, you know, we've said it in the off season, we, uh, meaning you and me off camera <laughs> and, and lesser yeah. and I on camera more. And that is this hits philosophy. You know, it's it, some people, you know, any philosophy you're going to bring in can get a little bit of bad you know it gets old or whatever some people can get this thing people football players identify with this they identify with this idea of accountability for your you know like you said it's a meritocracy there's accountability for your actions here but this idea of hustle you know, this idea of like taking the ball away or you know protecting the ball when you're on offense and uh, you know playing smart like all of these things really do work together on a football field it's a pretty sound philosophy but what I like is where they're at from a talent standpoint is that this philosophy is going to keep them in games. I cannot overemphasize just how good it is to not see penalties. That's the zero, one. Zero penalties on That's offense. That's the one. So you is... know, the number of the number of drives that were killed from holding from you know false starts like right off the gun right in the Nagy era. None of that on Sunday, right? And if nope. that continues, that is going to keep you in so many games. It's not going to be tolerated. Like they laid the line that we're going to lay out responsibilities. They're going to be clear. You have to do them or you'll go. And if you play dumb football and dumb football consists of, right? Which is my favorite thing. Because you can say, oh, if you play dumb football, we're going to not like you or not play you. And people go, what is dumb football? No, they say dumb football consists of penalties, not getting seven guys to the ball on every defensive snap. You know, not finishing your blocks as a wide receiver. We're going to we're going to nag you about that on tape. And if you don't do it enough, we're going to play somebody else because that springs a run. Right. All of these things are laid out very clearly. And 
it's so refreshing on the penalty front alone because we as Bears fans have become very newer, very regular <laughs> with, oh, there goes, ah, you're just going to get eight or 10 of those a game, right? No, for fans of the Raiders, one of the most penalized teams in the league last year, the Cowboys, the most penalized team in the league last year. Like I was watching the Cowboys game on Sunday. They were chucking, they were chucking drives away in the second half offense and defense, just throwing penalties out five, six, seven throughout just the second half. And I was like, Oh man, I remember that feeling. I don't have nope. that anymore. I don't have that anymore. I had, I had like, right. no, I had a clean game and it's not lucky, right? You say, if no. it continues, it's not lucky. It's expected. It has right. been drilled. And it, again, the accountability comes, you, okay. You're going to fall start on a big third down. You think you're going to be in there next time? We have enough offensive linemen that you don't have to be. That's the other thing. That's where roster building supports these philosophies like hits and, and clean games and everything else. Because like, oh, you think we don't have another? Like other than Justin Fields, do you think we don't have another X? Yes, right. we do. We have right. two and they will play because we care more about them doing their job than we do about having an extra 3% of talent, which you clearly have. But if if you're pulling us back with those penalties, the 3% offsets, it's an even race and they're going to play. Special shout to Equinibius St. Brown for his block downfield to have that touchdown with uh, Dante Pettis because that wouldn't have happened without him. So exactly what you're talking about here. Guy that, you know, wasn't you know targeted in that play, but he's blocking downfield on a busted play and that springs for the touchdown. So that's exactly what we're talking about. And yeah, I got to say, that makes this team fun to cheer for. Like, yes. <laughs> it's going to be a fun year. Again, I will stick by that the win-loss this year does not matter. They are not built to be competitive as a deep playoff team, but they will be fun to cheer for because they will be in games. And that's that's what you want to see. There's so many times where the Bears weren't in recent memory. So uh, let's let's talk about these beers and let's get out of here. We've already... We've already gone, you know, to a long episode, which you know is what it is. But I'm I'm happy to, uh, uh, to get back in the swing of things and to talk about these two uh, players. But this uh, gifted scorched almond porter um, from Australia, uh, it's really good. I would have another one. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's not overwhelming in any sort of flavor direction, which a lot of those, a lot of beers that have flavor names in the title. Like sometimes you just take a sip and you're like, whoa, okay. Like that's, that's way more than I ever wanted. This is nice. It's subtle. Um, it's not overwhelming. Um, and it was very drinkable. 5%. You could have a couple of them. It's good. Gotta love that balance in beer is very important. We just talked about balance in football. Balance in beer is very important. Um, Fitzy, yes, I'm using your koozie and it was wrapped around an Elliott Bay Baja lager, uh, 4.7%. So again, very sessionable beer very easy drinking, um, nothing outstanding that's going to sort of stick up on the palate and say, watch out for this. But at the same time, very flavorful and enjoyable, not a, not a watery beer that avoids, you know, bothering you a flavorful beer that again, has some balance, has some body, has flavor for being only 4.7% and, um, very, very drinkable stuff is also USDA organic. I just found a little label there. I didn't know that. So, uh, oh. Bonus. Yeah, good stuff. But I uh, love Elliott Bay. They're great. Their food is also wonderful. Had some um, wonton poke tacos last night, which was really kind of fun. They used oh, wonton I'm... wonton shells as a as a taco shell. I'm into that. I'm into that a lot. Oh, yeah. it was so it yeah. was so good. So uh, you we should tell folks you are going to come out this way. Uh, in oh, well, we we're going to make that a surprise, but maybe maybe people forget by then. No, no surprises. No surprises. No surprises. Yes, we. No, at some I, point, I, I you know what? It. Here's the surprise. We won't say when it is. That's right. We won't say when it is, and we yeah. won't say where we're going or what we're drinking. But we'll definitely go places and definitely drink things. Yes, we will. We will uh, um, be meeting up at some point this year. So, yes. um, well, let's get out of here. I want to let you guys know what's going on because EJ and I have other projects. Uh, the cool thing is that when we started, this was our project. We have grown into many, many more projects. <laughs> yeah. Oh. We're much busier than we used to be. So uh. check out the 10-minute drill. It's a new show that Robert and I are doing. It's a preview show. The idea was when we previewed last year, a lot of Bears fans, that care about maybe the skinny on the game, right? They want to hear more about the Bears. 
Uh, they want to hear what happened. They don't necessarily care about the opponent as much, but they want to know a little bit. They want to have just a little bit to kind of talk about and look for in the game. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to preview the game in, in, in 10 minutes, hence the 10 minute drill. Uh, Robert's producing it. He's in front of a green screen. He's in the studio. It's very cool. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here, but like he projects me in. It's really fun. I think we're going to start releasing that on Friday mornings. Um, and so, so be checking that out here on the second city gridiron. Um, and, and we'll also release it as a podcast. And then on Sunday mornings, um, I'm finally doing this live stream that I've had this idea for, for, for quite a while where every Sunday morning for as long as I can remember, I have woken up and I have thought about who I'm going to start on my fantasy team. And I've always been like searching the internet for some sort of like resource. And then recently, what bets I'm going to make? What, what are my final picks here for the game? Who am I going to take in Survivor, right? Is this the moment of truth? You know, when it hits 11.59, like you got to lock everything in. And so I'm pairing up with Ross Reed, who uh, is a Chicago Bears fan, really good dude, um, knows his betting. We're going to be doing betting lines and we're going to be doing prop bets. Uh, so, so really fun there. I was a perfect six for six in week one in, in, in my bets and I was four out of five in my prop bets. So, uh, I was hot, uh, week one. And then Eric Smith, who's the editor of the QB list. We're going to talk about survivor league. We're going to talk about daily fantasy and we're talking about fantasy start sets. So if you have a question, if you want to talk about a trade, we will talk about your league. So come join us. Put questions in the comment box. We're there for you every Sunday morning on Second City Gridiron. You have a bunch of stuff coming up with bootleg. What's going on with you? I do, but I want to shout out both those projects because they're really cool. 10 Minute Drill, I think, fits a niche that doesn't get hit properly. People go really long or people go super duper short, like 90 seconds, and you don't really get a flair for it. 10 minutes feels really exciting to me. And and with Robert producing and and combination of your talents i'm super excited about that and you and i have been talking about your betting show forever and you finally have it and it's uh just ironic that it's with ross because literally i don't know if you know this ross was the first podcast i was ever on oh wow yeah mac and reed show back in the day shout out to the mac and reed show lester couldn't make it and he called me up and he said you want to be on a podcast and i was like i don't know how to be on a podcast i haven't been on a podcast and so i subbed for lester on mac and reed and that's how i met ross so uh really Good cool dude he's gonna bring my cool ratio up that's all oh, really what this ross all about. ross is he's like mike tomlin he walks yeah. in a room and everybody just goes man who the hell is that that guy's the coolest guy in the room yeah ross ross just exudes cool so Shout out to you guys. Those are both really cool projects. Um, the biggest one just got announced today. So about two hours before this show uh, released, the new bootleg football podcast uh, for week one launched. And in that, we announced what we have been sitting on, like mother hens shepherding their eggs for a long time. We are going to have two shows a week now. The second show is a Thursday night football live stream. We'll be going live on the bootleg football YouTube channel 30 minutes before um kind of think of it like the manning cast but with brett and i um so we're gonna be we're gonna be doing that we're gonna start out without guests we might get guests later on down the road but uh that'll be kicking off tomorrow night which is both scary and cool um and we'll be doing that every week so you'll get the bootleg football podcast coming out on tuesdays typically it came out on wednesday this week so because we had a couple of logistical things uh but and then we'll be on for the thursday night live streams as well um so other than that, I am heading, uh, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow I have to pack because Friday morning early, I have to fly. Uh, I'm flying into Austin uh, Friday afternoon and meeting up with a longtime buddy of mine that I actually went to high school with, going to a Friday night lights game in Austin, uh, staying in town that night. We have tickets to UTSA, Texas, at Texas the next day. Uh, and then we'll do the three hour drive up to Dallas on Sunday morning because we are going to Cincinnati, Dallas, which we were looking oh, forward nice. to as like a really serious game, which now we don't know who's playing quarterback. And it's, you know, I'm just super excited. The Bengals are wearing those absolutely fire all black uniforms. All um, the all blacks. OK, they're super sharp. And basically, yeah. we're going to do high school, college pro in three days. So it'll be a it'll be a great football weekend. That'd be cool. We'll follow you on Twitter, of course which is not at the Draftsman FB. It is now. 
Oh, sorry, Football EJ. Yeah, new new season. Uh, I that feels like a long time ago, and it was like not even a week ago. No, it's, it's like a week ago. Of, I know it's been that kind of week, though. I mean, yeah. I, I, come on, I've been to LA and, and I know I've been know. to the Monday night game since then. Uh, yeah, no, needed a new Twitter handle. The Draftsman FB served me incredibly well over the last oh, it's I've probably been on Twitter five or six years. Uh, I've been doing draft stuff for much longer than that. Um, but uh, it just feels like a, a turning point, a new chapter. So football EJ seems to sort of encompass all that. It was available. Uh, it's certainly easier to remember for folks, which is really nice. Uh, and things are going well on Twitter there. Uh, yeah, Jordan, no Quinn Ewers. Uh, he hurt his shoulder for Texas. I was really looking forward to seeing him. But yes, B. John Robinson and a bunch of guys on UTSA because, you know, I love my UDFAs. So. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks for joining us for the kickoff show here. Uh, we'll stick around for the YouTube guys for a little bit to talk Q&A, but we'll end the podcast here. Thanks, everybody. Bear down. Okay. We're clear. That was good. Yeah. I liked it. I'm going to cut my part down too much, but other than that. Well, I, no, you it's know, too much. like anything early in the season, you're trying to figure out what works. You're trying yeah. to figure out, you know, the balance. And anyways, you know, I, we'll listen to all these or sorry, these people. I always point the wrong way. These people over here, we'll listen to all these people and they'll tell us whether or not that it's enough, too much, too deep. You you let us know, because, again, new format for us. We're learning all the time um and we want to know what you want because yeah we make this content for because we like making it but we make it for you without you there's no content so um tell us what worked what didn't um what you're excited about what we should add what we should take out we're we're open to suggestions to an extent <laughs> to an extent i said open to i didn't say we'd do it oh man um, yeah no the, the the fun thing about the off season is that there's all these ideas and and uh, I imagine that it's a lot like a coach's room where it's like, oh, we could put this guy in here. Throw it at the this. wall, see if it sticks. You know? And then you get to the season, and you're like, wow, remember back in April when we had that idea? Like, we never developed that out. That's not going to work, man. So there's a lot of good ideas out there. We're, we're, you know, again, we're playing with new stuff. We're really proud of this lineup. Um, we've got, you know, seven podcasts that we're going to be doing every week. Um, you know, I'm on three of them. So like, if you don't like me, then it's not a great thing, <laughs> but <laughs> if you don't but, like JB. It's time. to right, go it's, it's rough, right? But he's but running I the think show. That there's, there's an angle for everybody. And, and I think that that's, that's really cool. And I think some of them dovetail in with each other. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's a, there's, there's at least some elements that kind of tie together each week. Um, and if you, if you're following along all year, I think it's going to paint like a really nice landscape picture of, of what this team looks like and where it's going. If you just want to pop in for some of the interviews and stuff like that, I mean, you know, Bill's always a great listen, right? So, you know, and he's that, that interview with Erlacher, I think is up. Um, or, yeah, or he's killing here, it. So. Like that's, I love Bill. Bill's I mean, been so kind to me professionally and he does, he is so hooked in there. There are great many people in this business that say they're hooked in and talk to people all the time. Like Bill talks to people all the time. It's part of his, it's part of his regular job, his professional, uh, approach. And, and, you know, he's interviewed Bill Parcells and Belichick and like, he did a whole series on Thanksgiving football last year. And he was talking to like the who's who of head coaches for the last 20 years, he was interviewing them all. So like, he's one of those guys that's a tremendous resource to the channel and, and also super passionate, right? We get his, we get his fan side, which is awesome. Um, yeah, we, we get a little behind. You know, we have special, you know, group chats that, you know, we can't really talk too much about, but it's great to get that sort of stuff. And Bill and I go back and forth with the history stuff a lot, um, which which is really fun. So, you know, there's a uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff to, to to push, you know, some of this stuff out. And I don't know, man, I'm just really excited. I, and, and that first game, I know it was a monsoon. I don't care. Like it, it was still fun. And I think you saw some things. I don't think you can properly evaluate an offense um, no. based on what you saw, but I think that you can get the sense of how the team is coached and how resilient it is and their leaders, right? I feel like the leadership showed through and I'm not just talking about the coach. I'm talking about Justin Fields and, you know, I love, I love the fact that he dove in the end zone and did this. I mean, it just like, that's the kind of stuff that just, 
wins you the city. And I, I think everybody was on board with Justin Fields already, but that sort of stuff just reestablishes itself. So, um, yeah, a couple things. Let's see. Um, yeah, maybe Fitzy. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I don't. I don't know. We'll see. I might. I might show up, but I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a whole lot less tempted to be flying all over the country when the snow starts flying and the travel gets sticky. I had. Fitzy, I had on my orange hat before it started, and it just didn't look right with the shirt. So I, I, I changed. I got to shout out the background, man. You've worked hard on your background. You've added the pennants. You did the paint. You, you had all the art. Now you got yeah. the helmet. Like you, this my is background game is yeah. My background game has to has to come up a little bit. I did yes, the lights does. and uh, uh, this but is actually that's, pressure that's for happening. for for you and for Lester to Lester. Well, to get, get come on, Lester's that, got a curtain. Come on, that red that's curtain different. behind him. I got to He's got to get him out of that's that different. room. No, he says I'm, he's close. He says he's got the new. Yeah, room no, develop, you'll so. you'll be seeing some changes to the to the background here within the next few months. But um, no, I, I got to shout yours out. Yours is yours is really tight. I like it. Um. Yeah, this is my mom. She's number it's one. True. It's true. It's true. Uh, if you listen to the Hopium Den, the last episode featured her. So you can listen to you can listen to my mom and I talk bears. But my mom talks a lot of bears with me. So this is she is number one fan. She's number one supporter of this podcast. As well. Oh, by far. First and first and only first and best. And then no, you said no. famous Jeff, and that's clearly not me. So that's that's somebody <laughs> else. But uh, I I am not used to that part, by the way. Like uh, oh yeah, so. people people coming up to you at uh it's at, at it's great. Legion. Like I love it. At, well, Legion or SoFi, and then, um, SoFi. Oh, so a Legion it happened. Um, SoFi. Uh, and again, everybody that has gone out of their way to do that and that's really what kills me is like you're at a game that you paid for, and these people are like on the other side of the stadium. We don't publicize what section we sit in because we don't want people like showing up and crowding other see me. And so that's that's not fair. Uh, you know, if we're going to do a meetup, we'll pick a bar or something. But uh, we just, you know, post pictures of the field and people like detectives like go, hey, I'm at the game. And that looks like they're over there and take time during the game and hike across. They did it at, at SoFi. They did it at Lumen as well. And come up and say, hey, you know, they're really cool about it. And, you know, we really like. You know, I really like what you do. I listen to all your content or 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 whatever else still catches me sideways. Like I I don't I feel like uh you know Ricky Bobby, right? I don't know what to do with my hands. Like I'm like, you know, it's super cool and thank you so much. And what can I possibly say to you that is gonna live up to this expectation you have of whoever you think I am? Um, but it's really cool. It it's it's really cool that people take that much time, go to that much effort, especially at SoFi. SoFi was cooking. Like it was 97 yeah. degrees outside and it was. Well, so here was, you have hot. people coming up to you in 120 degrees SoFi and Lester and I get pulled out of the stands because they, they accuse us of, of filming practice. Larry Mayer is actually pointing at oh, Lester to man. get him out. That's him, oh, isn't it? And it's what? like, what? The, no. the culprit is about as different looking from Lester as you could possibly get. But that's yeah, okay. that's I okay. know neither here nor there. No, we haven't gotten booted from a stadium yet. We'll see if we can work on that. But um, no, but you might get booted from practice if you if yeah, you if hold we your phone up. in a certain way that oh, that God. makes them believe that you're taking. If we yeah, if we show up story. at practice, John, I appreciate um, the the shout out to to Windy City Gridiron. For, I mean, you know, we've both put in a lot of effort over the years, and you know. Um, I've done a lot of a lot of writing, um, some of it good. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it good. Let's yeah. be fair. And uh, I mean, you know, it's it, it is a. I'm really proud of that site. I think it it does a really good job of, you know, it, you know, for the most part, being a very uh, balanced way to get your Bears information and a way to, I think, communicate good football. Um, you know, and not be hot takey, which is what we're all about that's why we started this and yeah that, that was that was the core value of this is we're not gonna do shout core sports podcasting we're not gonna we're not gonna react to things or overreact to things we're gonna we're gonna have our takes and we've had some strong ones uh we've had some early ones that people would call hot but they weren't they were measured they were based on you know we've been looking we've been waiting to see movement here I'm not seeing any movement. Okay. Still no move. Okay. It's time to call for a change because this is not working and it doesn't look like it's going to work. So that's where we come from. That's why JB and I get along. That's why we still do this is because we really enjoy it and we, 
you know, still learn from each other. And, and we just see things, not necessarily players, but we see the overall sort of how you build a team, what works in the NFL similarly. And that makes it a lot of fun. Uh, just let's just do two more and get out of here. Cause uh, sure. it's not, it's not so far, but it is hot in this room and I'm sweating. So yeah, I, I, I gotta tell you, JB, we're, we're in that, well, you know, what we're in, we're in that great middle. Uh, I love, I love that. Time. It's so perfect. It's, it's Jordan, like, you're like back. I will highlight your comment, you know, uh, Steal any advantages. Uh, steal Green any, Bay. I think the advantages are all Bears defense can steal advantages against all these backups. You well, know, that, that to me is, I mean, I think they, that and the, the Packers aren't the Packers yet. Like the Packers played super poorly on offense. And that's what everybody concentrated on because it's always about Aaron and his relationship to his receivers. And it was always going to be that way with Devontae moving on. And would they, you know, rebalance to the running game where they had more seniority uh they haven't i think we'll see some of that because it'll be out of necessity lafleur will say that's working and the and the past game needs some more time to gel cook whatever but what very few people are talking about is the packers on defense were horrendous and they had their starters like they're not missing starters on defense like they are on offense they're missing two offensive linemen obviously they don't have the same firepower that they've had at wide receiver, but on defense, they had everybody. They had Jerry Alexander. They had all their pass rushers. They they're not missing people on defense and they busted coverages left and right. Everybody said, you know, Justin Jefferson had the greatest game and look, it's nothing on Justin Jefferson. He doesn't control the defense. If you throw him the ball, he's going to try and get yards and score. And he did that in bunches. He did about 30 to 40% of his damage on busts on flat out, just like they didn't play defense. And so I'm sure he's hoping everybody does that all year. He's he's definitely going to get some more contested routes. And Justin's a great, great receiver, top probably five to eight in the league. But it, the, <laughs> you're going to go that deep? Uh, I'm going to say that he's, I said today in the podcast that came out that he's going to be fighting for the top spot with, uh, you know, Devontae, because look, Devontae had a great game too, and you got to knock him off. He's earned it. He's, he's not leaving the number one spot. And then Jamar Chase is full throttle, no sophomore slump, wasn't a, wasn't a fluke. Like here I come. He's, he's going to give no ground in that race. So that's going to be a great sort of three headed player race going throughout the season to see who can outdo each other as sort of the top spot of wide receiver. But look, Justin's top five. I mean, cause there's a lot of, you know, good players on bad teams and you got to put in there and whatever else, but like the yeah. Packers defense was not just bad. Like it was broken, atrocious. Yeah. So all the questions they have on offense, which is what everybody's talking about, but the defense that you think those meeting rooms are fun. They were not. So the bears have a, this is a real game. Like this yeah. is a real straight up game for the first I time can't in believe a long time. Underdogs or nine and a half point. Uh, that's that's a line I'd I'd get it's, into. It's um, it's, a, it's absurd. But it's, no, it's going to be a fun game, and it's going to be a real game for the first time in a long time, and that feels really cool. Doesn't matter how it comes out. Again, we talked about this earlier. Win loss doesn't matter. If the Bears play tough, they could win the game, and that's that's legitimately fun. And I just want to end on this one. Ask how Alex, we, I mean, I haven't yeah, heard T anything T about him. He's yeah. got mono, so he's out. He's on the uh, NF, whatever that list is called. Non, uh, non football injury, NFI. Non football injury, NFI, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, I don't, that's not my question. I, I'm going to twist it a little bit and say, what do you think the expectation is for, for what Leatherwood can bring to this team? Like, was this a worthy gamble? Is this is this someone that you see can uh, potentially develop into a starting piece? Yes, it was a worthy gamble. That's that's not an issue. If you go back to his college tape, I mean, he's an Outland Trophy winner. I mean, like, like you know, this is a guy that he can do it. Um, he has the skills. His feet are really good. A lot of people get into his feet and say he doesn't have the feet. That's not true. His feet are really good. Um, if you want to know more about the technical side of Alex Leatherwood, where I learned it was a piece that Ted Wynn and Mitchell Schwartz did on The Athletic. Ted Wynn covers the Raiders, but he also writes generally nationally about football for The Athletic. He got Mitchell Schwartz to come watch Leatherwood tape with him and talk about the specific technical pieces of where Leatherwood's game holistic game was breaking down 
And it was about his hands and largely about his hand placement and his hand angle and uh, kind of like a cascading failure or dominoes or whatever. And you know this from playing offensive line. If the first thing you do busts or breaks, that's it. You're playing catch up. You're over your toes or, you know, if your hands get batted down, your feet are in the wrong place and you're, you know, you're using some other skill to try and catch up and you're just, you're basically again on your back foot. They were talking specifically about his hands breaking early in the rep and how that needs to be corrected because after that, everything else just kind of fell. And that's, those were the reps he got beat the worst on. So he has all the skills. He's on a rookie contract. He's a massive dude, like mm. physically from a frame standpoint. Um, he's, he's huge. And you'll hear varying opinions on tackler guard. Some very smart people, people that are way smarter than me about offensive line say he can still be a tackle. Duke notably Duke Mannyweather says he can be a tackle. I'm of the trust Duke camp. He's right more than he's wrong about offensive linemen. Uh, I tend to lean guard, but again, I don't know what those guys know. Um, the one right. thing I do know is that he needs really smart coaching, like really smart coaching because he is by all accounts. I've never talked to him, but he is a very cerebral guy. He is a guy that needs to know the why. And, you know, again, not surprising to you as an offensive lineman, you and I have had this conversation many times that oftentimes the most intelligent people on football teams are the offensive linemen. They have a, a, a really wide breadth of understanding about the entire offense and everybody's role. He fits that mold, apparently very intelligent guy. And is not the kind of guy that you're going to get out a big stick and go push harder. That's not his gig. Um, so if they can, if they can find the unlock with him, which Mitchell Schwartz thinks is his hands, I it's a gamble we're taking for sure because there's so much there and the cost, both the, you know, opportunity cost and the actual monetary cost are super low if he works. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I agree to me, it was worth the gamble. So, um, we'll see what happens, but we'll end it there guys. You know, we're going to be here all year. So really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, really cool to see all the comments here. Uh, bring your beer, bring your, bring your water. I would mean, bring a beverage. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah, have to bring be what you drink, whatever bring it is, bring what you drink. So, uh, appreciate it guys. We'll get out of here. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night.